So I, I too want to say how pleased I am to be here. This is just an amazing meeting and um, I've been invited to various meetings in India over the years and never bit because uh, it was just too far, but uh, I couldn't pass this one up. It's just, it's a real inspirational um, meeting and one that I'm very pleased to be. Hope, hopefully I can say some things that will resonate. Um, uh, the, t the two talks, the, the, just the previous talk and Tony's talk, have uh, resonate very much with the kinds of things I want to say. Um, one of the things uh, that was said in the, in the previous talk was the biological metaphors for scientific organization. And that's one of the things that I'd like to talk about today is uh, I've been, spent my life trying to understand niches and networks and those I think are very good biological metaphors for what are important in scientific organization. So I was asked to talk a little bit about my sort of career trajectory. And uh, I also don't feel like I do a career. I do science and that's my life. I live and breathe science. And so I never thought of this as a career and I still don't, although that's the, the way people think about it these days. But so I, when I started, I was an undergrad at the University of California in Berkeley and I decided I wanted to do medicine. But like Tony, I wasn't really prepared for the rigor of the kinds of classes. And although I kept the scientific track going through my undergrad, I tried all kinds of other things because I just didn't think I was good enough for this. And so I spent a year doing theater arts. I spent a year doing archeology. span I just explored. But in the end, actually after taking six months off to just kind of meditate over where I wanted to go, I decided, well, I really should go back into medicine and that was probably my calling. So I went back, I finished um, the classes, I applied for medical school, and I got into medical school. But in my last semester as an undergrad, I took a class in human embryology. And this really transformed my life because I was just mesmerized with this amazing feat of how a fertilized egg could make an embryo. Um, this was in the, this was early, before it, probably long, maybe before your parents were born. <laughs> I'm a grandmother, remember? <laughs> so, um, I'm not a real grandmother, just a scientific grandmother. Um, anyway, so this was the question, but it was something that excited me in the era when molecular biology was just a revolution. And so I wanted to understand this black box at the level that people were trying to understand um, molecular genetics of coli and gene regulatory networks at that time. So this was my question. What's the molecular basis of animal development? Okay, I was enthusiastic, totally naive, <laughs> idealistic, and I decided this is what I wanted to do. I decided not to go to medical school. I turned it down. I had, of course, not applied to a grad school at that point because it was too late. So I uh, went to Copenhagen. <laughs> That's an obvious choice, right? So I'm um, taking time to explore the world and find my way in science. So I went and I worked there uh, not as a, a technician, which is what I wanted to do, but as a, I, I was actually on the medical school faculty there with my BS from uh, Berkeley because the union laws in Copenhagen wouldn't allow me to be a technician. So they had to kind of finagle their way into to giving me a faculty position. So I taught um, histology in medical school there. Um, and then did experiments with vertebrates because I only knew human embryology at this time and I thought they, I really, I didn't know there was anything other than a vertebrate thing. <laughs> but I soon learned that in the early 70s, this was not the way to go if you wanted to understand the molecular basis of animal development. Um, it was really crazy. So I thought, well, maybe this was just not something I could uh, study. Cognition and neuroscience is another really uh, important uh, area that I was very interested in. I spent um, a summer at Woods Hole taking their neuroscience course and learning electrophysiology because I thought, well, maybe I can study another big, big question. And I, but what I really did in Woods Hole was I spent the summer, I did learn electrophysiology, but I spent the summer reading in the library. And this also uh, brings back something Tony was saying last night about the importance of Wilson. Was I, I spent, I read all of the, early, not all, but a large number of articles about the early experimental embryology, and I, I realized that's what I really wanted to do. 
But because I wanted to do molecular basis, I was going to go to grad school. <clears throat> and I went to grad school in, at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And my expectation was that I would do it in T4 phage or coli, something where I would really learn the basics of molecular biology. But remarkably, there was a new assistant professor there who had just started. He had done his postdoc at the MRC in Cambridge. Um, and he was starting to work on this little worm, C. elegans. And I view this as the E. coli of animal development. See, it grows on petri dishes. You can grow it in vats and 10 to the 6 animals per liter culture. It's, uh, it's extreme. So I thought, OK, I'm going to start in on this. And what I did uh, was just start by mapping the animal's uh, development cell by cell. This was inspired not by my PI, but by John Sulston, who was still at the MRC at Cambridge. Um, and he had figured out that you could, uh, a method for doing lineaging of these cells, and had, with uh, the help of Bob Horvitz, had, had taken off a chunk of the animal. And he had emailed my PI, David Hirsch, and asked him if they might want to be, we, we might be interested in doing the other chunk, which we did, and that was my PhD thesis doing the somatic dynamic of, of the animal. I then decided, well, this, I wanted to go to Worm Mecca, which was the MRC in Cambridge. So I um, got my degree, went um, to the MRC. And when I went to the MRC, John Sulston um, had finished this bit uh, that I, is circled in blue. And he then left and went into a room and spent the next year just figuring out the embryonic lineage, which was quite an amazing feat. I mean, these things down here were pretty easy by comparison. But he managed to do the, um, the embryo. But he also pretty much disappeared. Although he was a mentor, uh, like John White did for Tony, he, he, I was very independent. So that, this is one of the things that I wanted to bring up, is I, th I think um, creating your own niche, but it's, it's very useful to have an institutional niche. And the MRC was just an amazing place. I never would have imagined how important this was. One of the things was that the postdocs were independent. There was no lab structure. I mean, there were mentors who would sign your paperwork, but you were assigned a bench, and then you had to figure out what you're going to do. And the money, there was no funding for individual labs. There was funding for the whole institution. So the independence was, was really striking. In addition, there were just an amazing cohort of students and postdocs, and this gets back to the theme you've heard, and the networking, how important this is. So, you know, Stan Fields, I don't know how many of you know Stan Fields um, invented the two hybrid system, Richard Harlan, Doug Melton, and there, there were Kim Naismith. Many people were there as junior people, and when you look around and you're looking at your neighbor next to you, these are the junior people who probably in 20 years will be the senior leaders in your field. So you know, pay attention to each other now as juniors because uh, it will, those, the friendships you're making just at this meeting will last you for a lifetime. <laughs> there were also uh, senior researchers there, and they were liberated from grant writing, teaching, and committees. They actually still worked at the bench. Fred Sanger was still at the bench trying to figure out how to sequence DNA. Uh, Sidney Brenner was at the bench. Francis Crick was still in his office, but uh, he loved to talk, and that, that was also really fun. And th these guys uh, were totally liberated to do what they wanted, and they were mentors. We went to the canteen three times a day. We went for coffee, lunch, and tea. And we talked to these people. The seniors went there, too. Max Perutz went with his little banana and his hello, because he had a bad back and he didn't like to eat the food they had up there. But he went to the canteen and he sat next to us and he talked with us about what we were doing. So this environment, uh, this was before email, it was before social media, it was before any of that. We talked all day about science, about ideas, and there was a tremendous emphasis on trying to figure out what the groundbreaking discoveries, because at the MRC, like I think many places in India, there wasn't a lot of money. There weren't great facilities, um, but there was the energy of the people. And those people were spending a lot of time figuring out what's the best idea and what's the most important, incisive experiment. So that was a great training ground. And I, I, the more you can do to, to just um, bring that to your own institution, create that own kind of niche, 
um, for yourselves and for your students, uh, the, the, I think, more successful you'll be. So clearly this is important for networking. Um, so I want to go back a little bit to the science. So when I was a postdoc, I wanted to ask what cells do. Now this is an invariant cell lineage. In fact, I wanted to mention, I drew this. Everybody sees this diagram, but as a postdoc, I figured that the world needed to have this, and so I sat down for two days in the coffee room and, and drew this out. <coughs> um, and so everybody, so the, back in those days, it was thought that this was a, a mosaically um, controlled animal where cells were decided, you know, their fates were decided by ancestry, whereas vertebrates were more regulative and, and where cell interactions were important. And Sydney posed this as the European versus the American model of uh, fate determination where the ancestors versus neighbors were important and worms were at one side and humans and vertebrates were at the other. I didn't believe this. I went to the MRC thinking that animals were created uh, with all of these mechanisms and I wanted to test this. And luckily John White, who also featured in Tony's, um, had uh, developed a laser microbeam that could be used to kill individual cells. And this allowed me to ask. Now, John actually went on sabbatical. Talk about independence again. He left his laser microbeam. He didn't really have that much interest in doing the, the actual experiments. He wanted to create the machine. He went on sabbatical and um, left me to play. And in doing that, I um, focused on the lineage that I knew and loved. And I found two, I think, very dramatic interactions. One was a distal tep cell niche for germline stem cells, and the other was anchor cell induction of a vulva. Now, um, I focused for my career on the first one of these, and to, to describe that, I have to expand this lineage diagram just a little bit to say that it doesn't include all the cells. Everybody calls this the complete lineage, but in fact, it doesn't include the germline, because the germline stem cells are, are born in the embryo by this asymmetric cell division, but then after um, they're born, they divide variably, and they generate about 2,000 cells, which is twice the number of somatic cells um, in the adult. So uh, simplifying this then to um, the niche, uh, this would be the distal tip cell niche, is a microenvironment required to maintain stem cells, much like the niche of our institutions are um, maintaining the young investigators. I wanted to just show you the cells because they're so beautiful. Here's, here's the germline, the stain. Here's the niche in a diagram. But this niche in uh, scanning EM is clearly a single cell that sends these little processes out. But now with more modern technology, uh, this just shows you, yes, it is really a single cell, this nucleus, it's one nucleus. But then if you look at a cytoplasmic GFP, it sends out these ex extensive processes. And then if you meristolate that GFP and use confocal microscopy and focus in, you can see that it sends out these little processes that are extending in and around a pool of cells down here. So this is a very, it's a fancy niche, and niches are, um, in, in, uh, can be very fancy. Anyway, so I, I started my own lab in 83, and this was, you know, I didn't have the, GFP had not been invented. This is not my vision of, of that cell at that time. This is more the vision. But I, what I really wanted to understand is what the molecular regulators are. And so um, I wanted to say where my lab was and why UW-Madison provided a great niche. And it was different from the MRC. There are many different niches, and you have to always take advantage of the niche that you are in and then create from there what um, will work for you. But this had a cul culture of collegiality that was really important. It also had superb graduate students. Not as many postdocs, some postdocs, but the graduate students are fantastic a very strong tradition of multidisciplinary research, um, a great infrastructure, and it was a tremendous place to live. It was, uh, it was small enough that you know, I can walk into lab, it's, uh, it's, there's not very much crime there, so it, it, it was a, a good place uh, for me. Then uh, I was lucky enough to be selected as an HHMI investigator in 94, and this reinforced my niche to no end. It was uh, really a, a great thing uh, because of the very strong emphasis that the HHMI had on discovery research, the stable and generous funding of HHMI. And, and you know, generous is good, but stable is in some ways more important. 
that I could, you know, I didn't have to worry that there was going to be money in five years because they, you always had seven years with HHMI. If you didn't get renewed, you had always had another couple years. So you, it, th this was really uh, very important. And then, of course, it expanded my network tremendously. So getting back to my question, what are the molecular regulators? Well, of course, the, uh, at this point, the, the uh, RNAi hadn't been invented yet, so we went to genetic screens. And uh, what we, uh, we did lots of, lots and lots of screens, and we found the notch receptor in one of these. Of course, we didn't know it was a notch receptor until we spent the three years cloning it that Tony mentioned. It. But we had um, a, uh, a mutant and a whole series of alleles of that mutant that where the germline stem cells did not only divided once or twice and then differentiated, and this was the notch null mutant. But we didn't find that much else from the screen. And what we really wanted to understand was, first of all, the whole pathway, which is another whole story, but then what's downstream? And this is where we came up to a roadblock. And I, here's what I, something, the lateral thinking is very important. There will be times you, you have a big question and you're trying to understand it and it's not falling out. You have to think about something different and see if you can't make some other inroad. And so, what I had found in these genetic screens I was doing was a lot of uh, genes that affected germline sex determination, how um, a germ cell decides to be a sperm or an oocyte. And this was a, a question that nobody had really any traction on in any um, organism. So I thought, well, if I can't study stem cells, I'll study something at least that's important and un unsolved. And we, I had identified a... Um, series of genes, these were from genetic selections, where it, it, they, um, there were single nucleotides that were changed in a um, three prime untranslated region, which was ba barely even named at that, that time. So we found these mutations and they flipped the um, sex from one sperm to oocyte. And that was really um, something that we totally didn't understand. We wanted to understand if something bound there. So of course we turned to genetics and looked for the, the the regulators that find there, and we couldn't find them, we couldn't find them. And so then, what was uh, quite nice was a very trusted colleague, uh, Marv Wickens, had, identified, had figured out that a good, uh, a very important method was the three hybrid system, and he invented this together with Stan Fields. Both of these guys were at the MRC, I, I mentioned them when I went through, and they stayed friends, they invented the three hybrid system to identify RNA binding proteins. And so um, I collaborated then with Marv to identify a protein, the FEM3 binding factor, or FBF, which bound this element. And of course we had really perfect controls because we had these mutants that we knew didn't bind. So th this was very important in, in identifying these proteins. Um, and FBF is really the collective term for two genes, FBF1 and FBF2, and we didn't find them genetically because of redundancy. But we could find them by just looking laterally and finding them with this three hybrid system. And luckily, FBF then took center stage in the lab because not only did it regulate the sperm oocyte decision, which we knew from RNAi, because at that time RNAi had been invented, we had a protein and a gene, we could knock it out, we found it was involved in the sperm oocyte decision. But then when we made mutants in it, deletion mutants, we found that the stronger mutant also knocked out stem cells. So not only was this, we, we'd gone laterally because we couldn't make, we had, didn't have traction um, with, uh, on the stem cell question, but we were really lucky that FBF was waiting for us there and it could tell us something uh, very fundamental about how stem cells are regulated. And this is a member of the PUF RNA binding protein family, which includes Pomelio, and Pomelio right at about the same time was being shown to be absolutely crucial for germline stem cells and Drosophila. So this is a conserved regulator. So this uh, detour had not only uh, not, we'd gotten through the detour, but now we'd opened up the lab to have two decisions that we were working on. FBF linked them, but they were also uh, very different decisions and, and very important in their own right. Um, we worked uh, for a number of years on, on the network that controlled the decisions of stem cells versus differentiation. FBF was right, a hub um, at the center of this network. 
And we did this originally with candidates that we had pulled out from mutations, but then we went genomically and we found out the FBF is a very broad spectrum regulator that controls um, over a thousand RNAs and this controls differentiation programs including the meiotic program. Um, so th this, this was a, a, a big breakthrough, our discovery of FBF. But what we really wanted to know then, of course, but you're never satisfied. <laughs> you know, you've, you've got the key regulator, but then, you know, what's the notch target? I mean, notch is really important. And we, by that time, we knew it was activating transcription of genes, and we, it, it wasn't activating transcription of FBF. So uh, what was there? Okay, so th that was something that we also ran into a roadblock um, to try and understand. And we went off into another completely different direction that I'm not going to take time to tell you about, in the wind signaling and asymmetric cell divisions. We spent 10 years there while we were muddling around trying to push through the roadblock. And we finally, uh, again, did do it, pushed through it, and again, we were running into redundancy. And what it turns out is that there are two genes, SIGL1 and LST1, that are the direct notch targets. These are not similar to each other and they're not similar to anything else. They encode small, intrinsically disordered proteins, um, but they are redundant for germline stem cell maintenance. And as I'll show you very briefly, they're key stem cell regulators. So if you knock them both out, they have a phenotype that's identical to a notch receptor knockout phenotype. And this was, we hadn't seen any other mutant in you know, 30 years that had this phenotype. So this is screaming out to us that they're important. And then uh, more recently, in unpublished work, we've been able to drive each of these independently and shown that they can make a germline tumor in the absence of notch signaling. Uh, and so they are what's, they, they on their own can do this. They are really important. So um, here we are again, we have these genes, they're intrinsically disordered proteins. What do they do? This is our current kind of thing that we're muddling our way through now. We're trying to figure out what they do. Um, they are, uh, if I could have the lights down, is that possible? Maybe, I don't know, this is so pretty, I want you to see it. <laughs> um, so these proteins are uh, confined to a region right at the very end, and this is the germline stem cell pool. They're cytoplasmic and they're granular. We don't really understand, we have ideas, but I, that's not what I, I, you know, it'd take me a long time to convince you that our ideas have any yeah, at least I'm not going to go there. But uh, these are our current mystery that we're trying to understand. And at the same time, we've identified direct notch targets. And uh, we have a system here which is really well designed to visualize a notch. So we've taken this other slight detour to use single molecule fish and quantitate the transcriptional readout of notch signaling. And we can do this now in wild type animals with endogenous genes and no reporters. And to, in my, uh, you know, I've been looking, nobody else has been able to do this, and you know, we're doing it in a living animal and looking at the transcription, and because it's, we have the genetics, we can dial up and down the notch signaling, we can quantitate it with MATLAB um, of these images, and uh, so I think this is a very powerful way of looking at transcriptional activation. So these little purple dots are the active transcription sites inside nuclei. And one of the take home lessons we've uh, found is that it is um, a probabilistic um, regulation that you, you know, when you use reporters and overexpressed transgenes, you see, you know, things come up and it's all glaring. But if you look at it in an endogenous animal, some animals are, or some cells are, are responding and others aren't, or some, some chromosomal loci are responding and some aren't. And this was not something that we expected, and it's something that we're now uh, pursuing um, as well. So uh, let me just finish by saying we, we've had, work, been working on these two decisions. And um, I told you that FBF is a broad spectrum regulator of differentiation RNAs. This is not something we expected to find. Everybody is transcription factor mad, and uh, we thought we would be finding the transcription factors that were doing this, and we, instead we found this broad spectrum RNA regulator that I think might be similar um, to when you think of transcription, there are the po there's the whole polycomb uh, mechanism that's, that's down-regulating transcription, and I think that FBF 
and the puff or pomelio-like proteins are similar, working on a different level and very important for stem cell regulation. Um, in our work on the spermocyte decision, I really haven't talked about this at all, but uh, let me just tell you kind of the bottom line. This is unpublished work. Um, this is the thermoregulator of this, the sperm oocyte decision genetically, and we've now both we've crystallized it and used uh, done and looked at it, all of its uh, the genes that it's regulating. Fog three also pulls down about a thousand RNAs. It's another broad spectrum RNA binding protein. It's working as a polymer, and it's uh, we, when we eye clip it, it eye clips to across the three prime UTR. For some reason, we don't know why it's restricted there. Uh, and it's you know of the thousand um, RNAs it's pulling down, they're virtually all oogenic RNAs, and this has been uh, very likely to be a repressor, but we haven't figured out the mechanism. Fog three is also in cytoplasmic granules. Uh, and so we're moving in this RNP granule uh, uh, as well. But what comes out of this is that in the germ line, in germ cell fate decisions, and germ cells, you know, so what actually when I started working on the germ line, it was in part because Bob Horvitz at MIT had taken over the SOMA, <laughs> and I thought, I have to, I don't want to work on exactly what he does. And the germ, germ cells are really important too, and so maybe I'll work on something very different. So I, um, and I hadn't expected to find that germ cells um, march to the, a different drummer, that they are, uh, well, they, they use intercellular signaling and transcriptional control to regulate genes. What they, they're doing in both the stem cell and the cell fate is to regulate these broad spectrum RNA regulators that are then dampening down um, the gene expression. And my thinking, and I, this is basically thinking or speculation, obviously, is that the germline depends on RNA regulation to maintain its plasticity and totipotency, and that if it used chromatin and transcription factors, that it would be locked in place and it would be much harder to open it up um, for fertilization. So um, this is my, not nearly as your, uh, your last slide, which I, I love, but you know, I think it's very important to both find and create a supportive niche, both for yourself and when you're starting up, and then for your students and postdocs as you, uh, you grow up in, in your careers. Um, both develop and maintain networks, and you're coming here, you're going to be uh, meeting people here that will stay with you for your lives. Every, every place you go, take advantages to go out and meet people. Uh, something that I've done is I've been on committees all over the world, and the people that I meet on those committees, again, stay with me, and uh, that's been important. For, um, I, but I, just something I don't have here is learn how to say no politely. You will be asked to do many things, and it's important when you, because you're asked to do many things, you need to select things. So you need to learn how to prioritize what you say yes to, and how to say no without um, offending people. So the way I say no usually is to say, well, let me think about that for a day. And then I have a chance to figure out my excuses. So, um, <laughs> or if I really want to do it. I actually do think about it. Um, you, you need to choose your uh, questions very carefully. Again, you want big questions, but they have to be tractable. This is the art of the soluble. You have to find a question that you can solve. It's got to be important enough that, that it's a mystery, but uh, defined enough that you can actually solve it. That, that's a, a real art, I think. Um, you need to choose the people you work with very carefully. You need to choose the, your mentors very carefully when you go to postdocs, and you, you, and you need to choose uh, your students, your collaborators very carefully. Um, this is kind of mirrors something Tony was saying, but I would say put one foot outside at a time outside your comfort zone. Keep one foot into kind of safe territory so you don't to totally lose traction. Put one foot out, test the waters, and then if you're having fun, you can take the other one out there. So I would say uh, step outside your comfort zone. I've always been outside my comfort zone, but I've always also had a little bit of, you know, known that if uh, ways to retract and, and re reboot and go different directions. And then grab opportunities and gamble. This is also something we all do, and we all have to do it continually. Um, and so you're all doing this uh, now, and I'm, I wish you very luck in throwing the dice in the right way. Um,
my niches and my networks, all very important throughout my career. My current lab, a uh, fantastic group of people, and um, I'll stop there. I, no, no buzzers or bombs going off. Thank you for that. <laughs>